pray to prepare ourselves for God's Word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Today we finish our series on the book of Acts. Each step has revealed something about God's power in the world and our human response to that power. This morning's sermon is no different. I want to encourage you in your faith, knowing that God will see you through the trials and struggles. We begin today with an emotion that we all feel, but many may feel guilty about. We begin with anger. I remember hearing a few years ago about an incident that happened on a movie set. It was so dramatic that it spread like wildfire across the celebrity news shows and social media. It was from the set of the movie Terminator Salvation, the fourth movie in the Terminator series, which I think no one here has seen. But anyways, <laughs> in a lengthy audio clip from the set, you could hear Christian Bale, the star of the movie, screaming and berating someone. Uh, it turns out the director of photography was changing the lights in the middle of a scene, and it set the actor off. For a full three and a half minutes, he swore more than I've heard anyone ever swear at a person. Now when I see Christian Bale in a movie, the first thing I think of is that moment. He's doing a new movie called Exodus where he portrays Moses, but I won't hear Moses speaking in that movie. I'll just hear Christian Bale swearing at a poor guy who moved the lights at the wrong time. Now, I know Christian Bale is not the only person who has ever exploded in anger. I imagine we all have times where we are so angry we don't know what to do with it. I know at least one person here today who gets really angry whenever he is stuck in Jersey traffic. Don't worry, your secret is safe with me, David Garrett. <laughs> Some are angry at pro sports games, others are mad at the refs, at their kids' games. For some, it's the telemarketers, gas prices, cell phones, politicians, the list goes on and on. All sorts of things can make us angry, and it can do a number on our bodies, too. It can increase our risk of heart disease and heart attack. Some scientists think anger can be more dangerous than smoking or obesity. Hearing these things leads many people to have a very precise notion on this particular emotion. You just shouldn't be angry. In one poll, 28% of people said of their own anger that it was a bad thing. They thought their own anger was either harmful or useless. That seems to be the pervading notion out there. Anger is bad. So what exactly is anger? I've heard it said that anger is always a response to one of two things. It comes from a violation of our expectations or when we are blocked from succeeding at a goal we set. But anger isn't useless. <coughs> In fact, anger can propel us to action, even good action, when our expectations are violated or our goals are blocked. Here's one way you can think about it. Think of anger as your own personal sheriff, riding into town when injustice has been done. The sheriff sends out police bulletins to the effect of saying, hey, that's not right. That's not how we do business around here. It is going to happen. It is inevitable. There's no way we can stop anger from showing up. But if he's showing up for the right reasons, and if he deals with the situation in the right way, then getting angry can be good for you. If he sits down with the perpetrator and has a productive conversation about how to solve the problem, then anger is doing its job. On the other hand, if you've got a reckless vigilante who shoots every time he's angry, or a cowardly police academy dropout that can't even fire a gun, then anger is not very productive. As with chocolate cake, Anger has to be regulated with moderation. <laughs> and that seems to be the secret about anger. You can hold your anger in and let it eat at you and cause depression, 
You can let it out and harm the people around you or destroy relationships with others. Or you could choose the third way, called anger control. Controlled anger can lead to positive changes without doing the damage of the other two paths. Here's one more fact about anger. Couples who express their anger productively are likely to live longer than couples who suppress their anger. So maybe anger in itself isn't so bad after all. As Aristotle said long ago, the man who is angry at the right things and with the right people as he ought, when he ought, and as long as he ought, is praised. When we look at our story in Acts, we see some anger. The Apostle Paul has been ministering at the synagogue in the city of Corinth. He would work hard all week long with his fellow trade workers, Aquila and Priscilla. Then on the Sabbath, he would go to the synagogue and do his best to help the people there understand that the Messiah had come. And Jesus died and rose from the dead so that we might have life in its fullness. For the most part, they were not convinced by Paul, but he kept at his goal. He returned each Sabbath to proclaim the good news. Then one day, Paul's friends, Silas and Timothy, show up, and they brought with them a collection of money from another church. This was enough money that Paul didn't need to do his trade work anymore. So, Paul goes to these people again, each day talking about Jesus at their homes, in their businesses, at the synagogue, and everywhere he goes, he gets the same answer from these people. No. They don't agree with him. They don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. It says, they opposed and reviled him. And Paul is so angry. He's so fed up with these people rejecting the good news. He does this ancient act. He shakes the dust off his feet, signaling to the people that they may never have another opportunity like this again, and that Paul is, in essence, finished with them. The amazing part to me is not so much that Paul gets angry, or that he decides he's done preaching to these people. The amazing thing to me is what happens afterward. Paul has rejected this group of people that denied Jesus, and he's probably scared in this moment. I won't go into the details, but Paul had religious rights if he had, he's seen as part of the Jewish religion. And pretty much he has no rights as a Christian, which would have been seen as a new religion in that time. Paul's anger has gotten him into a sticky situation with the authorities, and he could wind up losing his life over it. But what happens? Just past where we left off our reading for today, there is this legal trial, one that could have dire consequences for the Christian faith in Corinth. One that happened because of Paul's <coughs> anger, his outburst in the synagogue. But what happens? The judge rules in favor of Paul. And Christianity keeps its protected status despite Paul's angry reaction there in the synagogue. Today, as my second son is baptized, I can't help but think about what a blessing children are. But if you have kids, you also know just how angry they can be. I'm sure there is not a parent in the room that would like it if someone edited together a video of your worst moments with your children. Anger can get the best of us sometimes. But what we see from Paul's experience is that anger isn't the end of the story. The battle isn't lost just because you get angry. It's what you do with that anger. And perhaps even more importantly, it's what God can do with it that really matters. This reminds me of another passage from Paul in Romans that says, God works these things to good. 
Some people assume that means God controls everything, doing nice things for good people, and zapping the bad ones for disobeying. But really, I think that passage is about how we change. God doesn't just give us what we wish for because we wish for it. When our life is submitted to the Lord, we are molded and shaped into the image of Christ. We are the ones that are changed, not the other way around. The good that God is working is in conforming us to Christ, drawing us to a life of service and love for others. God can bring good things out of bad when we live for Christ, even when we're angry. Don't you want your life to be like that, to be like Christ? It's not about never feeling emotions again. It's about having appropriate control over who you are and how you respond to those around you. When you are Christ's, you live like it. You bring God's good to this world. Let me end with this. There was a couple, Tim and Nancy, who had typical marital problems. Tim, though, had recently given his life to Christ. His wife, Nancy, was at first ecstatic, but as the days turned into weeks, she became more and more angry with him. This completely confused Tim, who thought that his conversion would make his wife happy and lead to a better marriage. After a Sunday morning at church, the couple came home for lunch and put their little one to bed for a nap. They had met an older couple at church that day and had invited them to come over that afternoon. Rather unexpectedly, a fight broke out between Nancy and Tim. Neither can even remember what it was about, but it got heated fast. Then everything came out in a terrible explosion. Nancy was so angry, she picked up a pottery mug and hurled it at her husband, who was able to duck out of the way. But the mug, it ended up smashing through the window of their front door. And as only fate would have it, that was the exact moment that the older couple they'd invited over arrived. They were not hit by the glass or the mug, but they did decide that maybe this was a bad time to visit with their new friends. So they immediately turned around and they headed home. Tim was completely embarrassed and lost it like he had never lost it before. He started yelling, hitting the walls and shelves. He smashed pictures and broke dishes. He went from room to room shouting and flipping over all the furniture in complete and utter frustration. No matter how hard he tried, no matter what he did, he thought, he could never satisfy his wife. When Tim finished, he saw the destruction he had left behind, and he also saw his little three-year-old son staring up at him with huge, frightened eyes. That's when Tim finally broke. His frustration turned to a well of tears as he wept and convulsed. He cried because of his lifetime of frustration, which wasn't his wife's fault. In that moment, he was broken in a way that would change the rest of his life. Tim held his family in his arms. They apologized to each other and asked God to direct their lives. That divine moment led to healing of both Tim's relationship with God and with his wife. From that day forward, they treated each other better, with respect, with love. God began a work in them that took them through the anger, past the pain, and to a place of health and wholeness. God can do the same for you. That's the hope we can draw on when we look at what happened to Paul. He may have been angry. He may have even lost it with these people who rejected Jesus, but God continued to work in him and through him. Be encouraged. God is with you too. God walks with you every step of the journey, 
even when you're angry, even when you lose it. As my parents would say, be angry and sin not. It will mean a better life for you and for all those around you. Amen? Amen. Amen. At this moment, we're going to have the ushers come forward. And as a response to the word, uh, I'd like you to offer up some suggestions. As soon as this service is over, I'm going to celebrate my son's baptism, and I'm going to spend some time with my family, and then I'm going to head on vacation for a week, and I'm going to put together the year's sermons for our church. So I'd like to take with me on that vacation suggestions from you. So I'm going to hand these to our ushers. They're going to pass these out. And if you'd like to, you are welcome to uh, raise your hand and they can give you a little piece of paper. If we run out, you're welcome to write on a scribble note. Uh, you can write a sermon suggestion on there. And the card says simply this. It says, in what areas are you or someone you know struggling? What topic would you like to hear preached in the next year? So offer up those suggestions, and we'll collect those, and then I'll offer up a prayer after that. So ushers, if you can pass that out. Mm -hmm. 